Welcome to our Innovative Approaches to Volunteer Leadership webinar series hosted by Get Connected. And today we are featuring Brianna Durellis of Connecting the Cause. And our topic will be responsible service, moving from harmful charity to co-dreaming. Today, our discussion will center on understanding how traditional volunteering practices have perpetuated harm and take accountability for the ways we've been apart. We'll also recognize how pity, power dynamics, and paternalism have oppressed communities in our sector and have created barriers for co-creation. Additionally, we'll discuss how to advance co-dreaming and take accountability for our roles in fostering community care. Stay tuned to the end because we're going to talk about connecting and facilitating relationships within spaces of care, recognizing barriers related to supremacy, racism, and power hoarding, and also working to shift our thinking to centering the community in all areas of engagement. All right, Brianna, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you so that you can start us off with really framing our time together. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you all so much um, for being here and for spending uh, time with me and with us today. Um, I know that uh, time is valuable and uh, you've decided uh, to be here. So I am thrilled just seeing the chat. I see some of my fellow colleagues. I see some of my friends. And so um, I'm really grateful to be in a space with you, with my people. Um, and I, I'm so, so honored uh, to be able to have this time. So um, as you know, you've heard the description of what we're talking about today. Um, you've um, been able to take a look at what we're going to be communicating. And so I want us to start off with just us framing our time and framing the context for uh, us talking and our, us chatting today. And so we recognize that we are community centered or we wish to be community centered and we are connected to an organization that has a community centered mission, but we recognize that creating harm towards the communities we serve and partner and walk alongside derails that mission and our own. So we must consistently and fervently ask ourselves, you know, what am I doing to create or carry out harm that derails that holistic mission and what parts of that must I be accountable to for creating that harm? And what can I do in my power to repair and rebuild? So we're working and navigating this space of wanting to center um, just these questions today. Uh, I know that as we go through the context and go through some of the material and, and have chats going on, I want us to continually think about the ways in which we um, are doing great but then also the ways that um, we carry out this harm um, in this space. It's our responsibility as volunteer engagers and folks who lead volunteers um, to do it in a way that's dignified and in a way that we take responsibility for. So I want us to um, frame our time in that today. Thank you so much for sharing that, Brianna. So tell us a little bit, you know, I'm sure the title was really intriguing for folks. What is what is co-dreaming? What does that mean? Yes, big question, co-dreaming. So um, co-dreaming in its essence, um, specifically when it comes to my work of navigating um, Black folks in community, when it comes to volunteerism, when it comes to racial equity, co-dreaming really means embodying and creating spaces of understanding how people want to show up in the future. Right now, in a lot of ways in volunteerism, we first tackle what is the need and the need tends to be really high on our radar. Um, but the thing we don't talk about a lot is even though I don't, um, I'm not in your body, I don't have your lived experiences, um, I may not have uh, all of the insights as to how uh, you move and shake and what you like and what you don't like. What I can do is create spaces of relationship and trust so I can understand what your dreams are for the future. And then if we understand what the community's dreams are and not just their needs, we are activating this space of I want to see 
a future you, a future self um, that is thriving and that is creating the dreams that you want to have. And so it's moving from how do I address just the need from actually I want to know what your dreams are, not mine and not what I want for you, but I want to co-dream alongside you. That means you are the one that is documenting and navigating what success is when it comes to partnership and when it comes to care. And so this is a community centric approach. And in order to think about that future self for the community, we must first navigate and name the root causes of why and how formal volunteerism exists in the first place. Why are people even showing up to volunteer, right? What are the issues and the systems that have been created for people to need to volunteer in the first place? And then we have to assess, so how does it currently uphold supremacy and white saviorism? We have to know where we've been to understand the future of where we need to go. So a lot of this is about the consistent disconnection from the ways in which we've harmed so that we can have this preferred future where we are dreaming with the community and not just addressing the needs in the community. It also worked towards a now and a future that centers the community or your neighbors or your clients as the drivers of truth, of justice, and they are the decision makers. I think we do a, a great job at asking what the need is at the beginning, but there's not a consistent partnership that happens along the way where we are able to navigate that with them. And so we do all this in co-dreaming so that organizations can move forward in partnership, accountability, and solidarity towards current and future liberation. So this is about freedom. And I know oftentimes, you know, when we think about best practices and when we think about volunteer strategy and leadership, it's a very like, what are the volunteer opportunities that are happening right now that we need to address? But I challenge us to think about how can we ground and root our volunteer strategy in the dreams of the communities and what they have desired? And how can we navigate our voices um, to be able to connect with that? Amazing. Thank you so much for for giving us that vision of co-dreaming. And I would love for you to just share a little bit more about your your own experience and what led you to this, um, this beautiful definition of co-dreaming and what it is that you're speaking to us about today. Yeah, absolutely. So I know for me, I grew up with um, a certain definition, honestly, of what it meant um, to have a sense of community care um, I know some folks have uh, heard about this um, and heard about my background, but my work in this really started with um, my dad and my mom. And my dad was such a um, pivotal uh, part of me defining what community was, that we would go to the store, we would go to town. So I'm from Statesboro, Georgia. It's about three and a half hours south of Atlanta, and it's a lot smaller. Um, and he knew a lot of folks. And so when we would be in the store, when someone would pull up at our house, he'd be like, Brie, you're half pint, because that's what he used to call me. Um, I want you to um, come up here and, you know, meet this person. This is your cousin. And I just say, hey, cousin. I wouldn't know their name. I wouldn't know their degree. I wouldn't know anything about them. He just introduced me as cousin. And I trusted my father that he wouldn't bring anybody in my life or intentionally bring anybody in my life that was going to cause me harm. And so as I'm meeting these cousins, what he's doing is he's building a tapestry of community care for me. So that if I'm going anywhere around town and if I need help or trouble, or I'm in trouble and I need support and I see a face um, that I know, um, that's my cousin. And so I'm navigating uh, this time, and I found out there's this thing called the nonprofit sector. And I'm like, what? You can help people and get paid for it? I'm in. That's, that was literally my initial thought. And I uh, go to Honduras, um, and I volunteer at an orphanage, and I have one of those, like, 
how can I do this for the rest of my life experiences? And then I joined AmeriCorps here in Atlanta and I feel like this is the start, I've made it. And then it hits me like a ton of bricks. And I'm like, wait a second, this isn't like what my father created for me. This feels different. I thought I was literally professionalizing what my father had allowed me to grow up with. And instead it was a complete disconnect um, from what I had experienced. And then there's boardrooms and there's key performance indicators and there's these strategic goals and like all of these things um, that don't necessarily line up with who I see as cousins, right? With who I see as people who um, are really being affected and this started me on this journey, especially me being a Black woman. I'm starting to realize here in the United States, there's such um, this disconnect in a lot of ways of all of the organizations I've been a part of. Um, the giver seems very clear of who they are, and the given to seems very clear of who they are. And I am trying to navigate, do I make volunteers happy or do I make community impactful? And I struggled with that time and time and time again of having to navigate, you know, what that looks like. Um, and so I decided that, you know, I wanted to start asking questions. What, why is it that there are barriers, barriers to even community members becoming volunteers? And then why is informal volunteerism looked down upon? And why is it that I'm entering these spaces and pity and paternalism is starting to come up? And so that's what sort of kind of started me on this journey of really having to navigate what it looks like to ensure that community stays in the, in the center of this work. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I know everyone will appreciate hearing more about you personally and your own personal journey. So let's let's dive in a little bit. What you've brought up some of the challenges. Let's like really kind of dive into to naming those. What are the challenges that and the realities that volunteer leaders are really um, facing? Yeah, you know, first off, you know, let me say I am not here to bash volunteerism. I love it. That's why I'm in it. <laughs> The reality is that the act of volunteerism is not innately destructive. I It, it has done wonders um, for myself, but also for thousands of people, millions of people, billions of people, right? And so we know it's not innately destructive. It's a way for us to live out care for one another. I don't have all that I need. You don't have all that you need, but together we have it, right? And so that just that economy of care is so important. But the challenge of that is that over time, we've created this space where it's the act of volunteerism when used as a tool for white supremacy, pity, othering, or self-interest it creates psychological, mental, spiritual, physical harm to those on the receiving end of service. I know that there are some folks in here who have actually navigated times where um, volunteerism has hurt. I also know that there may be some folks in the room who is like, I've never heard the word harm and volunteerism like uttered together. And so from my lived experience and from the experience of so many other folks um, that have navigated this space, especially, you know, as me identifying as a Black woman, there are so many times where I've been in front of bosses and I've been in front of supervisors. And the key metric is, are the volunteers happy? Did they have a good time? Um, I've seen times where we've chosen to not let a volunteer go because they've been connected to Buku's of money, but they've literally said racist things towards me and towards the clients that we're serving and they're continuing to be in the space. I've seen instances of self-interest, right? Of it creating places of dis dependency. I am so focused on showing up and saving, right? That there's no time for knowledge, for communication, for education around the communities and there's not any truth telling. And so I think there is such 
an important factor specifically around the Black community that either we're seen as threats or we're seen as needing to be saved. And there's like no in between oftentimes when it comes to the ways in which we're viewed. And so if you skew one way or, or the other, it's so important to navigate, number one, Black folks are not innately susceptible to being saved. Like let's, let's take that and put that out there, but what can we do to co-drink together? Because it does create an emphasis and a perpetuation of the psychological and, and mental damage that happens on communities through the use of when volunteerism is used for harm. Thank you so much for um, for that. Let's let's keep going and talk about some more of these um, realities. So the second reality is we all know that systemic issues oftentimes lead us to volunteering. There are issues that systems create. When I say systems, I mean education system, the healthcare system, the criminal punishment system. It's because of all of these inequitable systems, and I will say they are inequitable because when they were created here specifically in the United States, I was considered property. So I was not considered, these systems were not considered for me to thrive or for me to be in a space of um, care, right? And so with these inequitable systems, they push us to form nonprofit organizations, community groups, you know, corporate volunteer programs that just really spring us to act. And we come in to support communities from these harmful systems, right? We want to come in and be like, boom, we understand it's harmful. We recognize things are happening. But what tends to happen and the challenge is that in addressing the harmful systems, then we become a harmful system ourselves. And it's less of a system of care and more of a system of power hoarding, more of a system of pity and more of a system of boxing communities in to one place or another that's not really allowing them to thrive. Yeah, absolutely. We're getting some really great thoughts and questions coming in about these uh, these realities and these challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I'm tr I'm tr I'm trying not to like address each one. Of them. Yeah. So thank you, Erica, for, for saving the day with that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I also um, want to appreciate everyone in the chat um, that is sending claps and hearts because this this isn't a topic um, that is easy oftentimes for me to communicate about, especially if I'm not seeing faces and understanding like how people are feeling. So I want to give a special shout out to those who are affirming uh, in the chat. Um, but the next, you know, reality um, is that the nonprofit sector has a history. I have scoured the internet <laughs> in a lot of ways to try to navigate. Are there any historical pieces um, around the history of volunteerism and how it relates to racial equity. And it's so interesting because the volunteer story uh, starts out one way from a U.S. historical perspective, but then in a different way for how we were viewed. Because as, um, as the nonprofit sector was forming, as we look at volunteerism, we see that, like I said, I was identified as property and white elites, mostly male white elites, were the ones who identified who was worthy um, of getting service and who was not worthy of getting service. And that is how so much of the uh, history of volunteerism has taken place. And so the reality is that the nonprofit sector has in history and that history comes out of when we take a look at the traditional best practices of volunteer programming and strategy. But the challenge is that organizational volunteer practices oftentimes center volunteers themselves and not the community they are intended to walk alongside. So a lot of this can breed that paternalism, that pity, that power hoarding towards clients and neighbors. I have a colleague named David Park 
and he does um, excellent work in neighboring and shared care. And one of the things of, I guess, a mental framework that you can think about is so many times in the in the nonprofit uh, organizations, when we think about volunteer programs and volunteer strategy, what we tend to do is put the volunteers as the sun. When we think about the solar system, they are the sun and then the community sort of kind of orbits around them. And we've put them in the middle of the sun because number one, that's our job, right? Our job title says volunteer manager or volunteer leader. But what I challenge us to think about today is yes, you can still be a volunteer leader and volunteer uh, champion and engager. If we take clutch of pearls folks, if we take volunteers out of the center, we put community as the sun and the volunteer is actually orbiting the community, right? So then we move and shake and adjust uh, to the needs and the future of the community versus centering volunteers. Hey, what are their feelings? What are their thoughts? And how should things be run for them? Because what we're not thinking about at that time is we're not thinking about the community themselves. And so we need to, this traditional best practices, sometimes we professionalize people out of this work and it's severely heart work. It's severely people work. And we start professionalizing people out because we're trying to create these best practices and the efficient and the quick and the work when all of this is trust-based all of this is relationship-based. All of this is um, a long game. And so it's super important that we're not breeding these spaces of paternalism and pity and power um, as we walk through all of this. All right. Thank you so much, Brianna. Um, I know everyone, I'm I'm loving reading the chat as well. It feels like everyone is, we're all right here together. So let's talk about what do we do to take accountability and, and move forward in co-dreaming. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think accountability is so important and moving accountability to action. I think sometimes accountability can be a very verbal thing of, yes, I recognize that I have done wrong. I recognize that things are not right. Okay, so what are you doing as a result of now realizing that you need to take accountability? Um, and so this is this piece of, I think it's so important to have action steps to move forward in co-dreaming. All right, so let's talk about, you know, what what are these places we need to take accountability more specifically and, and how do we recognize them? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first off, addressing pity. Um, I think it's very important for us, for all of us to understand and recognize where pity is showing its head within volunteerism, um, specifically what practices and language and policies reinforce negative stereotypes about those that we are walking alongside. So I'll give an example of this. Um, I was in a volunteer orientation and when it was communicated to us, volunteer orientation, meaning I was the volunteer, um, and it was communicated to us, make sure that you keep your valuables close to you, that you keep your valuables, you know, stowed away, you know, locked up, da, da, da. Everybody was cool with that. Everybody was fine with that. And then someone uttered like, oh, this must not be, this, this must be one of those places, Right. This must be one of those places, meaning it's unsafe, meaning, you know, there's folks around who's going to take our stuff. If there was a, a shift in language in that moment, thinking about, you know, instead of, oh, these people who are going to take our stuff or, oh, these people who we need to pity, if there was a shift in saying, hey, everybody, um, it's really important that you put your, you know, valuables away because we want to make sure that they are kept safe from anybody in this room. 
right? So that we're not just talking about community from anybody in this room or anybody that may, that may be coming around, right? So it, it automatically took this shift of, oh, we're not talking about community coming in and taking, taking your valuable things versus look, looking at it from a holistic lens of anybody, right? Any, anybody even in this room could take some stuff, right? So it's really looking at the way in which we create these stereotypes in our brains and how they're reinforced through volunteerism. So it's really important um, as far as pity specifically is concerned to recognize that pity creates dependency. I was on a call and someone was like, the community just this community, we're working with the clients that we're working with. They just keep depending on us. Why do they keep depending on us so much? We are trying to help. We're trying to support and empower them. But why are they so dependent that they've lost their empowerment? And I asked them, I was like, which parts of your programming, which parts of your strategy is keeping them dependent? In what areas are you actually empowering them? And what areas are you stripping autonomy? And as we looked deeper, so many of their practices from the orientation all the way to the application um, of, of volunteers, all the way to in the ways they show up in community, they literally came as the saviors. So no wonder they're dependent because you keep positioning yourself as the savior as the one with the cape on, whether it's hello, here we are, or it's within the language or it's within the ways in which volunteers themselves are communicating with um, the particular community members. So one thing I love to address pity is number one, to create a space or an event between volunteers and community members that does not involve an exchange of service. I love this thought of creating a space where we're all coming here together and no one person doesn't have the t-shirt on or one person isn't passing the food, but we are all communally here together to share a meal, to play some games, to learn about each other, to learn about something. And I know that my ultimate goal is that we, you can't tell the difference between who's getting a service and who's actually giving a service, right? Who's getting it versus who's giving it, but it's all shared together. Another place to address pity is that community members are training and getting paid for and supporting and leading volunteers. And so who are you actually activating in the community that is not just the volunteer engager or the volunteer leader that is creating a space to learn from community members. One thing I feel that is so powerful and so important is that community members and clients are not just seen as, oh, the people that need the stuff that we give over there because I, they are moving to a, a project. They're, these are the people that we are coming and they're the project that needs to be solved. But there is knowledge and wisdom and storytelling and skills that folks that are in the community can be upfront and show. And what a dynamic experience is a client or a community member teaching volunteers, right? Showing volunteers, chatting with volunteers. That's not a sob story, right? That's not a, a woe is me. Let me coach you and how you should talk to these volunteers but they're teaching them from a space of respect and dignity, right? That's another way to address um, address that pity. And then just hide your lens of sniffing out these in instances where volunteers' egos are boosted um, for the detriment of the community. In what ways are you highlighting volunteers that as you highlight them, the dignity goes down when it comes to the community members. How can we highlight volunteers while also completely highlighting the dignity um, of the community members that are being served? That's excellent. And I feel like to the um, link that Erica is dropping in the chat to your um, volunteer opportunity design guide, mm. it's, it, because a lot, I feel like a lot of what you were mentioning is like how all of these different aspects are being designed and created from the beginning. Yes. 
especially in the example that you shared. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. Yeah, I important. think I think it's really important, you know, to be able this this what this is all about is not a finish line. It's not a I have arrived. It's a strengthening your muscles for a, for being able to sniff out, navigate and focus on, okay, where is community being centered and where are they not, right? So this is a muscle. This is something that we continue to think through. Me, myself, Brianna Dorellis, okay? There are white supremacy characteristics that I carry often because we are all swimming in this that I needed and need to continuously disconnect from that I'm still going on my own journey of, wait a second, why did you justify this? Wait a second, why are you using that language? Wait a second, why are you seeing this person in a certain light based on their lived experiences? I have not arrived. So if I have not arrived and I'm the one teaching, right? I'm the one having the conversation. We all in this together, okay? <laughs> so I just wanna make that point as well that this is a muscle that we have to keep have to keep working through. So this next piece is tackling paternalism. Um, A lot of paternalism shows up in top-down decision-making. We make decisions in the boardroom for the people on the ground and they're not in there, right? Not only are we making decisions for people who are not in there, once they're even in there, we're not listening to them. We're not having them navigate the ways in which we move and interact, right? overriding community preferences and desires, which creates a breakdown of trust and then a a, a, a silencing, right? And so all of these things take place when paternalism takes front and center. So paternalism specifically in volunteerism refers to this dynamic where volunteers, you know, often unintentionally, they adopt this protective and controlling attitude towards the community they aim to help when they believe they know what's best for the community. Let me tell you something else um, around paternalism that shows up a very specific example that I've shared in in other spaces. Um, There was this woman, this white woman that I was connecting with, she um, did mentorship. And there were um, a specific group of um, young black boys that were her people. Like these are the ones that I mentor Um, These are my students. Right. And she was telling me this, this convert about this conversation and what she was interacting with in her own heart, that after she would leave the mentorship program, she would leave and go to, say, Walmart, uh, uh, a store, and she would clutch her purse. She would visibly be uncomfortable. She could feel herself being uncomfortable with a group of black boys that were the same age as though she's mentored, but those weren't her boys, right? And so what we tend to do is that we are really comfortable oftentimes around black folks who need to be saved or communities that need our help, but don't know how to operate and navigate when we're not paternalizing them. When we're when we just want to be in relationship with them, right? And so I think it's really important to navigate that volunteers can be well intentioned. We ourselves as people can be very well intentioned and put on this hat of saving and paternalism. These are my folks. But then when we walk out of those doors, when we walk out of the framework of saving, we are literally harming that same community that those Black boys came from by seeing them as a threat on the other end. And so it's so important for us to look at this, not just from a professional perspective, but your personal experience are brought into this space. And you have to navigate as an individual, what ways are my own stereotypes, biases, racism showing up as paternalism, right? That's making me perpetually hold this, hold this community, these group of folks down. And so we have to be intentional at sitting at the feet of those who are deeply entrenched in the community we walk alongside. I need us to get out of our seats 
and not just talk to volunteers to see our impact. We need to talk to the end user, right? The we need to create a, a rhythm of connecting with community leaders, grassroots organizers, folks who have been in wherever for forever and learn from them, not extract, right? Not extract just to do your work better, but to be in relationship because this is about liberation for all, right? We have to create a culture that infuses client-based, community-based decision-making. If you don't have a framework or a mechanism for allowing community members to not only speak into, but be the drivers of the good, then I challenge you to really start thinking about this from a holistic perspective. And then create trust based on shared liberation, not expert knowledge. There is, there are so, there's so many um, articles and um, blogs about the uh, benefits of volunteering, which I think is great and I think is awesome. There's so much expert opinion on best practices, on, on, on knowledge. And one of white supremacy characteristics, of course, is the um, acknowledgement of the power of the written word, right? The written word is most in, in, important than the lived experiences. But I want us to get to a place where we are talking with folks who are deeply invested in community, who have been a part of community, who have been clients, right? Who are clients, and then really tackling the ways in which we don't infant, infantize them, but um, really see them as partners in the work. Thank you so much for that. Let's keep let's keep talking about um, these acknowledgements and um, and up next, I think is tackling power hoarding. So if you could just share with us a little bit about what that looks like in volunteerism. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when we think about power hoarding, I want this, I want to just share this one question, right? Where does volunteers hold the power? Where do volunteers hold the power in engagement spaces? And where does the community hold the power? And do shifts need to be made as a result of seeing what that power looks like? You know, the number one really addressing this is seeing and recognizing what the success, I've said this before, of the community themselves look like. So the success of your impact needs to be determined by those who are you are walking alongside. I need you to get innovative, to, to get creative. And as you are tackling the grant uh, numbers that need to be put in the grant, I would also love for you to start thinking about and considering how do we assess and track and design the data so that it also infuses community success and what community success look like? Are our key performance indicators what came directly out of community and their future and what they want and what they see? Are the preferred uh, indicators for success um, as what they see as success, is that also our program success? And are we galvanizing and motivating volunteers uh, to be those resources to support that future, right? Versus the other way around. Um, secondly, creating community-based feedback mechanisms, whether that's re regular meetings, surveys, chats. Um, I love, I would love for everyone to look up empathy interviews or empathy conversations. Um, I think that's really important um, mechanism. I want you to have on your calendar that you are meeting with somebody, a client, a community member um, on a rhythm, right? I know sometimes we can fill up our calendars. We're talking directly to volunteers, but we need to know at the end of the day, how are, is our volunteer programming, our, our volunteer strategy, how is it affecting uh, that end user, right? That client, that human being on the other end, um, as far as how they view the organization and the volunteers. And then we got to infuse this participatory planning, um, oftentimes we make the plan and then we say, hey, community, boom, here you go. Or we involve the community in focus groups and surveys and focus groups. <laughs> and then we say, thank you for all of your expertise. 
We appreciate it. And then that's extraction because they're not involved in what the process looks like for them being able to drive um, their own solution. So really think about um, that power hoarding too. And then we can go to the next one, um, which I think is, is, could be a whole nother one that we've been talking about in the chat is dismantling saviorism, which is, I believe so much of these pieces culminate uh, to, to saviorism because we need to ensure that we are not seeing particularly black communities because that's my lived experience as innately lacking, right? We were not born with lack. We were not born with being undignified. And so it is the world we live in and the systems that have not been um, for our thriving that lead us into this into the spaces that we are in. And at the same time, there is a level of understanding of who we are as individuals, knowing that we are also not homogeneous. All black folks are not alike. <laughs> I do not speak for every black folk, <laughs> okay, in the world, but recognizing the humanity of black bodied people and knowing that these systems were not designed for us. So you either have to ask yourself, either this entire population of people is lacking or there is an understanding that there are systems connected to their harm. One, which is charity oftentimes addresses the lack. Community care and co-dreaming ex examines their existence. And I think that's really important for us to navigate and have to understand. And so when we think about dismantling saviorism, saviorism will keep you in business. It will keep volunteers coming, okay? But amplifying neighborhood and community voice will create solidarity and long game change that you may not even see. So you have to think for yourself who you want to be in this space. If you want to talk about, hey, this community needs you so much versus this is the root cause of why you're having to volunteer in the first place, right? And not pinging people as projects to be solved, right? Someone who looks like me is a project to be solved, but really needing to navigate, do I actually see their humanity tied up in mine? Do I actually think that they are, are this separate entity that's doing their own thing and I'm going to insert myself and then um, do what I please when it comes to navigating their the harm? Or am I in this for the long run, right? So we, us, on this call have to change the narrative of volunteerism and what it is. It's our responsibility. We have hundreds of thousands of people who are in orientations right now, like right now. And they are either hearing a perpetuation of them being a savior through language. Um, thank you so much. Um, here's the organizational chart. And here's what you're going to be doing today. Or they're going to hear this is a long game and you serving food today is not going to end the harm, but you showing up day after day here and in other places where you choose to serve and as your own humanity is going to be the thing that moves the needle. Are you in this for the long game? It's okay to challenge volunteers and ask them, are they ready for a long game? Because this is movement work. <laughs> this is solidarity work if you choose to go the co-dreaming route. And so we have to infuse reflective practices for volunteers, right? We have to say, you know what? What did you see or hear today that challenged your perception of these folks? What are you going to say differently moving forward that's going to dignify this community and tell truths about this community when you're confronted with the lies? 
right? Asking volunteers, if it doesn't get solved tomorrow, are you okay with coming back for more, right? Being able to motivate them, not by saviorism, like stories rooted in saviorism, but by stories rooted in challenge and determination and building solidarity in a movement together. So we are the makers and creators of designing what the future of volunteerism can look like in terms of facilitating the work between community and volunteer, which the ultimate goal for me is that the community is the volunteer. Like that's the goal for me, right? That at the end of the day, the community is volunteers and we don't have a separateness of, oh, they're the givers and they're the given twos. But at any point in time, somebody can be a giver and somebody can be given to and there is no hierarchy in community care. And so that's how we have to dismantle saviorism. I just said a lot. I'm sorry. Well, not no. sorry, but sorry. <laughs> I think we're all really grateful. Uh, really loved hearing all of it, actually. So let's talk about like, because we talked earlier about accountability and action. So and I think you've laid out, you know, really for for everyone present, everyone watching this recording that this is a path and, and yeah. a long term commitment. So let's talk a little bit about what co-dreaming as a commitment looks like. Yeah. Oh, co-dreaming is not rainbows and butterflies. I'll say people be peopling. Community engagement work um, is not easy, um, but it is liberating for us and for those who engage with this, right? And so number one, I always say it is okay to interrogate the good. We all love volunteerism. And if we love it, then that means we got to know the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent. We got to know the ways in which we're harming. We got to know what it looks like to repair and rebuild. I give you permission to start today. That if your whole program, you're like, have mercy. This is a mess. That is okay, right? Even we, you don't even have to boil the whole ocean today. I told Erica yesterday, if you just take a pot and, and put some water in it, right? Take some of the ocean and, and boil some boil it on the stove. Okay. Like we got we to gotta start somewhere, right? So also this is a lifestyle, um, not a checklist. So we don't get to take this hat off and put it back on. This is not a um, something that we wear. This is something that we embody. We need to change the ways in which we see people, the ways in which we see care, the ways in which we see our profession, because it is intricately tied to heart work, intricately tied to, to, to humanness, right? We have to understand our own biases in our own areas of growth. There are so many pieces, especially if you are a team of one or a team of two, um, where your own biases can literally be wrapped up in policies and procedures. So you have to realize, okay, what season of co-dreaming am I in? And what is it like for me to move, um, continue to the next season? And then I said this before already, understand what's in your power to repair and rebuild. I think as I talk to professionals and people in this hard work, um, I think that we come sometimes with a posture of I'm just one person or I don't have the funding or I'm not the one that uh, creates the goals, right? You are in a position and look at your, look at your job description. That's what's in your power. And I want you to take some of those and say, okay, I can't change the entire volunteer appreciation event and I can't change this award that we give, but I can add an award. Nobody cares about how I do the application process. Let me make sure everybody's represented on this application, right? I may not be able to change the grant requirements, but I can add a story that's not seeped in saviorism, right? 
think about the ways in which you can move and shake because you do have power to repair and rebuild. I want you to take all of that power even within that and to be able to use that for good. And then this like this last and final piece is that deep breaths, everybody. I want all of us to be okay that you will not see the end of this work. If you start the work of co-dreaming, this is going to be a legacy that's passed down. This is this is a collective that goes up into the atmosphere that you may never even see. But the fact that you've changed language, the fact that you've communicated about root cause work, the fact that you've sw switched the way in which you share stories, the community or the client may not even know that a shift happened, but they can feel it, right? And what does that do to then dismantle pity, dismantle power, dismantle harm? What are those incremental changes that make a big difference for someone who is now being seen, right? It's okay that we will not see the end of this but that it is a baton that is going to be passed with hopefully either you being the start or you getting it passed from somebody else and you moving forward. If you've never heard this before and haven't been passed it before, I am giving you the baton today that you have now heard it. And now that you are aware, I affirm and confirm those who are already on this journey keep going and keep moving because this is the work of, of freedom, right? And not just the work of slotting someone butts in seats that I just hear all the time in my heart cringes, right? It's not just about butts in seats so we can get things done and accomplished, but it's about doing the work of long-term change to really be able to dismantle systems, but also create spaces of care um, for people. And so that's the sort of kind of the end that I, I want to, to end out on. And I want us to also know that we're not alone, that there are people on this call, that there are people out in the atmosphere who are carrying batons. And if we feel like we can't rest and we can't shut off for a second, then we are actually practicing saviorism ourselves, right? Because at least we know I can take a rest and I can be whole, right? And let somebody else carry the, the way. And then when I'm ready to get back up again, I can get the baton and I can keep it moving. And so I would love for there to be an instance where you all connect with one another. And so to know that you have other co-dreamers in the mix so if you want to put your name and your email address in the chat to connect with each other, to talk through more of this, you are able to do so. So put your email address in the chat so you can connect with other people who are also doing this work. And mind you, I am not even asking you to put your name in the chat um, to be put on a newsletter, to be put on my newsletter to, to get emails from me. You will not get emails from me if you put your name in the chat. We are literally only compiling this group of people and these email addresses so that you can connect with each other so you don't feel alone that you're by yourself in these concepts. So that's another piece that I just want to share. This is not even a marketing ploy. This is for you. I want you to be able to come out of this connecting with somebody that you can vent to, that you can run things by, that you can share things with so that when so that when the time comes, we can share this list and you can literally, you know, say, hey, y'all, I need help. So or I need I need affirmation or I need encouragement. So I want everybody to put that in the chat. Um, to be able to help um, and connect with each other. And of course you can connect with me. I would love to hear from you. I'm on LinkedIn and all other places that you'll get. But um, but yeah, thank you. I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Court, because I'm gonna start rambling and then I won't be quiet. <laughs>
No, I appreciate every word, every word you say, Brianna, and so incredibly grateful for your, um, your time, your presence, your energy, and for holding space for this community who has been live on the call today, um, and everyone who, um, at the, at, you know, organizations, um, cause I think some folks from these organizations are hopefully going to share with others at their organization, the recording, when we email that out. And um, everyone will receive the recording via email from us. You'll receive, um, you know, some bonus resources. Make sure to hop on this list. Um, we're going to share the chat as well in a download on the recording page so that you can connect with other co-dreamers all across the world, um, because this is definitely community work. And this is, we're a part of that community, all of us together. So um, again, want to just say thank you so much um, to you, Brianna, to Erica, to everyone um, who came live for, for being a part of, of this event. We want to make sure that we keep the conversation going. You can connect with Brianna at connectingthecause.com and also get more, um, get on that list for the Dignity and Design mini guidebook that's coming. That's going to be amazing. And um, we want to make sure that you come back and, and spend some more time with us. We'll have um, Nicole R. Smith with us next month in August for another great um, volunteer leadership community webinar. And um, if you've got questions for us, we're Get Connected by Galaxy Digital. And if you need tools, uh, that's what we do for volunteerism. So um, thank you so much for being here. And anything else you want to share in, in the final minute, Brianna, um, as we say goodbye today? Um, I just want to thank everybody for your comments, your thoughts, your questions. I am, I literally can't wait to go back and read all of the comments and deep dive, um, because I'm so excited to, to just see what you all are thinking. Um, and I, I am in this with you. I have not arrived and we are co-dreamers, you know, together, um, and so I'm, I'm really thankful and excited. Um, Court, Erica, thank you so much for this time um, and for having me on and me being able to be authentic um, and share exactly what I needed to share. And thank you for the Zoomies on the call. I can feel the presence of solidarity. Um, so I just hope that the conversation just doesn't end here. Um, but you have a chance to look at the resources, have a chance to sign up for the Dignity and Design Mini Guidebook and to share this with your colleagues and share this with your volunteers, right? Like how can you take some of this and actually share it with your volunteers? So um, I'm grateful for everybody on the call. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. I'm gonna keep rambling if, if you don't <laughs> make me be quiet. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. And look for that email coming from us in just a couple of days. Um, once we get this recording all prepared for you and um, let's stay in touch. We'll keep connecting and keep building community together. So thank you, Brianna. Thank you. Bye everyone. We'll see you soon. Okay.